Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick with myself Ryan and we've got Sam. Hello. So we decided during lockdown and obviously there's lots of time to be able to communicate with different people via web chat and via video calls and we thought why not use this time to interview a load of the filmmakers that we know around the world. And so what we're going to start doing is actually having midweek interviews um, me and my, well, myself and Sam will actually conduct these interviews, and um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy. This week we actually have David Black all the way from Australia, so he's an Australian filmmaker, and um, yeah, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing him uh, this week. So hope you guys enjoy. So welcome to Trash Arts uh, Talk. We've got David Black. How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic, and yourself, Sam? Yeah, I'm doing okay, as as one can right now. Are you in lockdown too in England? Yeah, we've been in lockdown for, let's say, it must be nearly three or four weeks. We decided to go into lockdown like a week before everything kicked off, because we felt like, you oh. know, it made more sense, right? We've been in lockdown for roughly the same period of time. It's crazy, but at least we can, we can keep creative at home. That's the only... Uh, benefit at the moment oh yeah yeah uh, there's always something you can do no definitely man and uh, all right let's, uh, let's get into questions um what got you interested in filmmaking uh believe it or not i didn't realize i was filmmaking when i was doing all of the videos for darkness visible so that goes back 12 years uh, i had my band and i real i'd been wanting to make videos for a long time and we went on TV, and uh, one of the guys that was working there on at Sin TV said he could make videos. So I said, yeah, let's make a video. But, um, even though he was right into the indie movie industry, he never told me about it or anything. It wasn't until like 10 years later when I was on Cult Girls, and at that point I'd made nine music videos, that all of a sudden... Um, I started talking to the crew because I'm seeing all of the equipment and they're telling me uh, that uh, there are Facebook groups for the indie movie industry and uh, they're getting me all connected and telling me what the equipment was. So I was making uh, videos, didn't know what questions to ask to find the indie movie industry and uh, it just sort of all happened 10 years later after I was already making movies. Oh, that's excellent. So the first kind of films you did make were the music videos for your bands. Can you uh, tell us anything a bit more about the music videos? Yeah, um, well, the process for making the music videos is exactly the same with uh, making uh, making the uh, films, except nowadays I, I don't have, say, the DOP saying, look, we're going to need this, need that, and then organising it. I actually know what I need to do and touch base with the DOP saying, hey, this is what I want to do, and then we'll have a discussion. So, um, yeah, with the music videos, I was still going out and getting locations. I was still writing up scripts of what we were going to do, except that there was no vocals in it. Um, I was still doing all of the same things. Um, but I also didn't know what the terminologies were. So in getting into the movie industry, now I knew what a DOP was. I mean, the first time somebody said um, they're a DOP, I, I thought they'd insulted themselves and said, no, you're not a dope, you're doing a great <laughs> job. That's crazy. And then after the music videos, you started producing short films which you'd either wrote or got cast and crew together. Could you tell us about some of those short films? Yeah, well, first started with me going on somebody's short film, and it was somebody I knew from uh, the indie movie, and uh, knew from the uh, band scene. I'd booked their band plenty of times when I was running the third degree. Uh, with a band, you end up having to book your own venue and run the night. And um, I'd done quite a lot for this person. I didn't know that they, their mainstay actually was making films. So they were doing cult girls. And so I went on that as a background extra and just absorbed everything that anyone would tell me and teach me on that. And uh, for about a month or six weeks, I just went on to different people's sets because from Cult Girls, 
one of the guys that was uh, crew, probably first AD, said, look, we've got to shoot next week uh, for the perfect nonsense. Do you want to come along and be an extra on that? And one person after another started inviting me. So I was absorbing what was going on and meeting people. And uh, the next thing, I was really just arranging to make my next uh, music video. So now I had a whole lot of people from the indie movie industry that I'd met, and I brought in people that had also worked on my own uh, videos before, got them all together, and we made that. At this stage, I still hadn't made my first short film, but... Um, I sort of got introduced to that by Dia Taylor, and this is like a real wacky story, but it was Dark Night of the Zomboogies. I was going along and networking at a local movie night, not too different to the ones that you're doing in Portsmouth, except it was called Boogie Nights and it was in Melbourne. And um, the guy there I, who was running that, I'd met him on Cult Girls. He was the armourer, John Fox. He also was the armor of the Pacific and a lot of big stuff. And uh, he said, you know, we're losing the crowd here. Um, we had a big crowd the first time we ran, half the crowd the second time, a third of the crowd the third time. And I don't know if they'll give us the venue uh, if the crowd keeps falling. And I said, every time I go on a set, there is a horde of extras. Why don't we make a film here? And... Basically, we made a zombie movie and it brought in heaps and heaps of people. The night was packed because they all wanted to be extras as either victims or zombies. And in doing that film, Dia Taylor was directing that and she brought me in on the team. She kept saying, look, you need to do this, David. You need to do that. And I watched what she was doing and I was uh, credited as co-director because it was, but she was the real director behind it. And I basically said, is it that simple to make a movie? <laughs> and from, yeah, from there, um, in the last three years since doing Dark Knight of the Zomboogies, I don't know, what am I up to? 25 movies that I've made? Well, I remember one of the things um, when we first started chatting is that you wanted to get as much content on the YouTube channel. Am I right? You were trying to do like a film a month, was it? I was, and it started burning me out. So um, I took a break um, over Christmas. Um, I had my four weeks annual leave. Now, I did still keep doing um, movie work. We shot two movies in that time. But I didn't knock myself out like I was because I spent three and a half, four years not being able to answer anyone's questions because I was just constantly exhausted. I mean, I'd get up where we'd uh, presented a movie, you know, at a movie night, and somebody had asked me a question and I'd had five of the movies bouncing around in my head and I couldn't answer anything and I was tired of being tired. <laughs> but anyway, look, I probably rambled there. Dark Knight of the Song Boogies, I think, uh, went out on your um, compilation, your anthology. It went out on Grindsploitation 666. That's what I was just about to, uh, yeah, to go on to because obviously you've done a lot of work with... Um, <clears throat> Not just trash arts anthologies, and just to make clear, Grind Exploitation Six 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 is Vestra Pictures, which is Tony's anthologies. <coughs> but, oh, sorry, that's yeah. alright. But you've done work for uh, Gore Theatre, um, Trash Arts Killers Volume Two, and obviously numerous anthologies that are currently, you know, being completed. How do you find doing international um, anthologies to be able to get more of what you're doing in Melbourne across to the world? How do you find doing that? Um. It's part of that time where I was exhausted and just couldn't think. So answering your question is very difficult, whereas now I can think. But what I can tell you is it was a process. The first thing we're doing, Dark Knight of the Zomboogies, was, hey, I can actually make a short movie. This has turned out well. Uh, the next thing was, oh, my God, somebody overseas is actually putting it onto um, an anthology that's going out on trauma. So it was this constant oh my god situation <laughs> oh my god they're going to show dark night of the zomboogies on uh, one of the overseas uh, american tv shows it was just oh my god oh my god oh my god um it was just um it was like being on a treadmill and um you know like a roller coaster you don't really see what's 
going on around you because you're moving too fast. No, I know, I know what you mean. And would you say though that like being involved with anthologies has helped your career? Oh, definitely. You've been a major help. You and Tony both, um, because um, I didn't want to say anything negative, but you know you don't get the positive without the negative. The more little successes I had in Melbourne, the more problems I had because you get a lot of jealous people. You get hate campaigns. So whereas um, going on cult girls and being a background extra in those first few ones, I met lots and lots of extras. They don't really like seeing you pull ahead of them. And um, this has been such a rocket ride that all I did was locally uh, make a lot of get it, find a lot of haters and a lot of enemies, but overseas where people just have met me for who I am at whatever stage, um, it's been the positive. Um, so, I mean, if I wanted to do a movie locally and I put it in a local movie night, I don't really want to go along because the place will be full of all of those idiot extras that have been slandering me behind my back. Half of them will be nice to my face, but I feel... I feel terrible at them because it's a bad vibe. But if I go on an anthology like Grindsploitation 666, I feel good. You're really nice about it. Um, Tony would be nice about it. If, um, if I'm talking to somebody who's a horror host on, say, a cable station in the USA, they're really nice about it. So um, I think I got lost with uh, trying to answer the question. No, I, 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 the thing is, I understand what you mean. And it's an unfortunate thing that you find on a local independent perspective. We have the same thing with um, some filmmakers close by who don't like what we do or um, don't want, you know, like they see certain levels of success. And it, it seems to happen like every city I talk to someone, there is someone who's fighting against them. But fortunately, as independent filmmakers, our aim is to get the work, the work out there worldwide. So it kind of like their perspective becomes redundant because the bigger aim is to get as much of an audience as possible and a receptive audience, wouldn't you say? Spot on. Um, in fact, I'm glad, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, from connecting with you and others, they started mentioning to me that they were having the same thing. It's, it's a bit like when they said the prophet gets stoned in his own city. Sorry about the dings if they're coming out. Um, because we're going via the chat on um, on Facebook. I've got people messaging me. But, uh, yeah, I started finding out that everybody that pulls ahead locally, they get slandered. But internationally, we're all working together. Exactly. It's a very strange thing. I, I, it took a long time to not pay too much attention to that and be like, well, why is it like that? Can't we fix that? Sometimes there's things that you can't fix and it's up to people if they want to join in with the bigger picture, you know? Oh, the bigger picture is fantastic. What I'm wondering about next, though, and I hope I'm not taking you off on a tangent, you work really hard. Tony works really hard. and You're not the only two. The, th the three of us work with maybe five or six others I think of that work really hard and we all work together. Um, we really need to get it to the next level. And um, that's my big question is how we do that. Yeah, that, it's always the tricky one because the you know, traditional is to try and get funding. So once you've got funding down, then you can make bigger and better productions, especially with anthologies and stuff. But with the current market as it is, the only answer I seem to find is to just keep creating stuff and eventually someone's going to want to invest in something bigger. That's all I've been trying to do. I used to think that way about the funding, but um, I probably spent um, about $8,000 and put in six months pre-production work on um, the very last Darkness Visible video. And uh, I don't think it's that crash hot compared to some of the ones that only cost maybe $500. Um, you, you can have um, a short movie that really has no money spent on it, and it can be engaging because the storyline was great, the acting was great, it was cut well, um, all of the camera angles were perfect. So it's not always how much money. I mean, there's a lot of big 
budget flops out there, and then there's always the dark horse that comes in that uh, just romps at home that was done on a shoestring budget. No, I totally agree with you, and I think that's why, like, I mean, a lot of the features we made can have certain budgets that go into thousands, but some budgets are, like, a couple of hundred, and it's more because I know I can shoot the story, I know I can get access to those locations, I know I have actors who are enriched by the script to take it where it needs to go, you know, so it always comes down to what the creative product is at the same time. Like, when you said earlier about zombies, one of the short films we did, we had 500 people apply to be zombies, because people want to be zombies desperately. I don't think they would nowadays, but two, three, three years ago, before yeah. the big zombie bust, yeah. boy, um, this story will blow your mind, but um, I think I've, I've shown it to you on YouTube, uh, uh, on Facebook, when, um, cult, uh, not cult girls, when The Last Hope, a zombie movie, was being made, I went along to that because I was an extra already in it, and they had a big meeting at the end, and they said, look, we've got this scene coming up where we need 500 zombies, and we don't think we're going to get that because we struggled to get 10 people in on this scene and that scene. And I put my hand up and said, look, I've been um, in a band for years. We always got publicity when we wanted it. I've got a lot of friends. I mean, I've got scrapbooks full of... Uh, um, I've got so many newspaper articles from the past that I actually don't have them all. I kept a handful, you know gotten a mess but I, I said to him look I'll get you some newspaper publicity everyone else there because I thought I was Johnny come lately just talked over the top of me treated me like an idiot but I got them the article and it got 16,000 applicants and they had to close it off 16,000 people insane. applied to be a zombie the minute it got into the papers and it didn't just get into one I got six star newspaper mastheads and inside eight leader newspapers it was like my god i can't believe i managed that <laughs> see we're all on the back of um the popularity of zombies mm. uh the makeup that we put on the zombie makeup in the picture they took of me was brilliant and it came down to throwing it out to the public saying we need 500 zombies it became the viral story of the whole year that's very cool, man. Now, with all these short films you've been making, I know that the next step for most filmmakers is to move into feature production. Now, last year you did, um, you shot a feature film, didn't you? Yeah, we actually completed it. And then um, we had some problems with sound on some of it. And um, it came up, well, we just um, fixed the sound, uh, redo the uh, voices with... Um, with their, our iPhones, because we've done it before and it's worked quite well. And I said, no, let's reshoot. And I also wanted to recast the main um, actress in that because she'd been playing up a lot and been problematic. So I recast it and we were to um, shoot over the long weekend for Easter, which is tomorrow. Tomorrow uh -huh. would have been when we'd go and resh start reshooting we were going to do Easter Sunday and Easter Monday. Well, we're in lockdown. Mm. So it's there, pretty much finished. Uh, it's, it's an amazing piece. It's not just a simple idiot schlock piece either. But uh, we do need to reshoot those scenes. There's three days' worth of shooting to do. And uh, it, because it's a Christmas film, it's got to be done when it's sunny and when it's warm enough to wear uh, short sleeves. So even if the lockdown uh, is removed, say, by June, we're going to be in the dead of winter. There's going to be no way we can stand there and not be freezing. Yeah, yeah. That's a, such a crazy contrast because we'll be boiling as hell in the UK by June. But, yeah. Oh, what you call boiling isn't boiling here. Well, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's, um, <clears throat> let's talk a bit more about the current projects you have right now. I'll give you an opportunity to basically plug yourself. Tell us some links to where we can see your latest work and a bit about your la latest work. Well, everything's on my YouTube channel. Um, you, you can always put a link to the channel I at will. the end. Although I've decided to um, branch out and um, take up uh, channels on 
uh, VO and Vimeo and a few other places. Um, I know this isn't exactly where you wanted to go or get back to where you wanted, but uh, I've realised that we're all facing the same problems with social media that our accounts get banned or get locked or we lose the accounts. So what I thought I'd do was just start spreading out all of the videos over four platforms in case YouTube ever gets uh, locked. Uh, I've noticed a lot of people lost their Twitter accounts, they've lost their YouTube accounts, they've lost their Facebook accounts. But getting back to the projects, because the projects remain the same regardless of the platforms they're on, we've just put up one called Babylon, Babel on Babylon. It went up last night and it was a very quick shoot, I think a four hour shoot about a nerdy uh, cult, satanic cult, that accidentally conjures up a real demon. So it's a, a short seven minute funny skit. Nice. Now I've got three others that will be going up too because I, I was making so many movies that I ended up with a backlog of films to be edited. So Babylon Babylon was probably shot over a year ago. Uh, the next one to come out uh, was shot at the beginning of the year which is uh, it's called Quest of Questions, and it's uh, an interaction between a wizard and a female warrior. And again, it's a simple, comedic one. Uh, it's got um, more going on than just pure comedy, but it's a, a statement on how things have changed. Then um, I've got two more after that. I've got... Uh, Boy, the names still, I keep forgetting them, but I've got the goriest one we've ever, ever done that's uh, in editing, and it's called Sinister Symbiosis, and I actually think I shot it for you, but missed your deadline. Which anthology was that for? Uh, the one on phobias. Ah, okay, okay. Was that yours? Um, <clears throat> we did one on phobias a few years ago. The recent oh, one no, we did was, was phobias. phobias. It, it was on, um, oh, what do you call it? Us. It was uh, when, when people have mental problems. Jeez, I forgot about it. Is it phileas? Philia, yes. Oh, that's I decided awesome. That I, was, I decided that I wanted to hit as many different phileas as possible. And uh, to do yours, I had, had it scripted. I even ran the script past and you said, that's fantastic. But the shoot kept being pushed back and back and back. And we finally did get it shot. And it's been like a year and it's only going into editing properly in a few weeks. And this one is just ridiculously gory because it was made for you. But we missed your deadline. So we'll have that. and You'll be able to use it for something else or someone will use it. We are looking and to do... Uh... A filia sequel towards the end of the year, so that would be perfect. Uh, yeah, it actually would. Uh, I'll be able to let you know more about it when that's edited up. We've got one just starting editing at the moment that is different from the rest. It's called Blag and Fluff and the Seventh Golden Shamrock. That's Everything it. in it is in rhyme and... It's more like a, a children's storybook. So yeah, this is what I love about all the stories you kind of create, Dave. They're very elaborate and kind of fun and kind of pushing the boundaries of how much what people can do with a short film. And I think you do that very yeah, well. It, oh, it uh, does uh, bother some of the filmmakers I'm with. So I've ended up with fewer filmmakers because I, I work a lot with Gerardo He's very imaginative, and he can make magic happen. And I work a fair bit with Farley, Farley Roth, who also is. But you can't always talk to everybody and get them to understand what you're talking about or to be adventurous. Just because something was never done before doesn't mean it can't be done. Mm. No, you know, you're right. <clears throat> so speaking of um, how much you can go within a story, what would be your dream project? Yeah, I was thinking about that and realised that um, I couldn't think of what my dream project is because every time I come up with the project, that's my dream. 
That's that's and that's a good that's a good position to be in though, man. Lots of people would love to be in that position. Well, I wasn't trying to duck your question either. Oh no. My when you mentioned earlier that um, at one point when we were talking, I was saying I didn't have enough product, and now I've got a hell of a lot of product. What I was um, actually aiming at in, earlier on was that I wanted to do a different genre for every single film. And that's pretty much what we're still doing. So if we've done one film, like we've just done the one with the satanic cult, I won't come back to a satanic cult horror comedy again. Um, if I did come back to a satanic cult, the next one would probably be dead serious and bloody. Now that makes sense. It's always good to challenge yourself with each project, really, isn't it? And to see if you can, even yeah, if you've done I something similar, find a new direction within that idea. Yeah, um, now some of the ones I'm going to do will have similarities because I'm always coming back to the same props and costumes. For instance, if I spend 500 bucks on a severed head, that severed head's going to be in three films. Yeah, <laughs> now that makes total sense. I think we have a cupboard of things that have been repeated for so many different films. On top of our own house has been used for so many films. It's just making it look a little bit unique each time. Well, I've done about six of them just around my block of flats. And uh, we did one, um, one of the, inter the... There's been a number of um, videos that have either come out or are about to come out where different horror filmmakers were interviewed. Uh, you've got one, is that correct? I believe, again, that's one of Tony's anthologies, but I know what you're talking about. And uh, you did also do an interview for our fear documentary, In the Dark which is in, um, currently still editing. But yeah, I know that you you did one on location for Tony's uh, documentary, I believe. Yep, I did one for you for fear. I did two for Tony and one of them ended up getting rejected. That's the one I'll talk about in a tick. And I did one for William uh, as well. I've forgotten William's last name. I can't click anything to find it because you get a ding come out from YouTube. So uh, yeah, I did four or five of them. And one of them, what we did was we actually went to all of the locations where we filmed. And as we filmed, we cut in a scene from that location so you could see us and see uh, the scene from the location. And you could see that we had just basically walked all around my block of flats. So in different corners and the lane down the road, they all looked like we went to different locations and they're all within um, one block. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's just you can look at, um, at something from a different angle and now you've got a new, um, a new set. Because to hire a set can cost like a grand. Yeah. Well, with a grand, I can spend a few hundred on a great makeup artist who will give you the best, ma best injuries and blood and everything possible. We can spend a couple of hundred, three, four hundred on a prop. We can spend a hundred to, or, or more to feed everybody. So I don't want to waste a grand on a location. No, I, I, totally, I totally understand that. It is trying to, you know, put the money into the right areas where you're just not feeling like, oh, God, that was so expensive for no reason. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Dave. And um, <clears throat> we'll put some links to, uh, to your YouTube channel underneath. And yes, you can check out your new short films. There's that, that new one that's come out recently, the, the Babylon one. So people can check that out. <clears throat> and yeah, I hope you have a, a lovely day. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me on it. And um, thank you for just being so accepting in working with me almost, I'll call it the beginning, even though it's like three years, but um, for being accepting straight off. And uh, I think we have a fantastic working relationship. Most definitely, man. It, it, it will continue. You don't have to worry about that. That's, that's a guarantee. No worries. Thanks. All right. Have a lovely day, Dave, and we'll speak soon.